forward, but I'll, I'll come back to that. And it, it, but it really was uh, um, kind of the seed that helped us move forward. And you know, I mentioned that neighbors had concerns about hazardous materials, you know, specifically lead and asbestos were, were big concern. Um, deconstruction does a much better job at handling this material than mechanical demolition. So for one, it creates less dust. Um, it's also increases the likelihood of discovering uh, unabated hazmat. So an example would be, uh, you know, the abatement contractor comes in, removes asbestos found in some uh, underlayments and flooring, and they don't remove the flooring underneath a cabinet. And then when the deconstruction contractor comes in, they uh, find something that looks like asbestos. They can call up the abatement contractor, have them come out and uh, safely remove it, and then work work resumes. You don't you don't see that with mechanical demolition. The other thing that was kind of going on at, at this period in time was a, a local art glass um, manufacturer, actually a couple of them, um, were found to be emitting dangerous levels of arsenic, chromium, and cadmium. And that was in the news, so it was kind of a heightened awareness about what was floating around um, in the air. And then you have this increase of um, demolitions, you know, over 300 a year, um, and that, that kind of heightened the awareness. And it really, I think, galvanized the, the community in support of deconstruction. And one of the things that I think help us, you know, move forward pretty quickly is um, in Portland, we already had a significant retail infrastructure for salvage building materials. Um, we had numerous outlets with different focuses, uh, several nonprofits, including the Rebuilding Center and Habitats Restore. Um, we also had a place, uh, or still have a place, um, called Salvage Works, which is focuses on salvage lumber, um, kind of higher end uh, value added. So they uh, they uh, a lot of times clean up the lumber, they kiln dry it, um, and uh, it's used in in different things from furniture to to cabinet making. And there was all. Already, kind of a, a built-in demand for a salvage material, and, and part of that's due to I think Portland's do-it-yourself or DIY um, and reuse culture here. Um, part of it is our design aesthetic and, and history as a, a timber town. These are some some examples uh, here in town of what what you'd see. Um, you know everything from restaurants to bars to coffee shops. It's actually pretty hard to not find this material showcased um, in our, our commercial and even like residential lobbies of, of condo buildings. It's old growth lumber that you can't get today unless you salvage it from an older house. And also around this time, um, the market for uh, kind of wood to energy or wood waste hog fuel was starting to dry up. So we had a, a large paper mill um, here in the region that, that closed, and I think they accepted 80 plus percent of uh, dirty wood that came from um, demolitions that they would um, burn for energy recovery, and and they shuttered their their doors, and that ended up um, you know putting additional pressure on finding alternatives for this material other than kind of quote unquote recycling it, um, which really means burning it. And, and that ultimately raised the cost of demolition by about 10% because they weren't, they were having to pay to dispose of it instead of uh, having it as a, um, something they could sell. And so I mentioned earlier the attempt to work with the demolition delay and try to find a way to incentivize deconstruction. That ultimately failed, but it, it it raised the topic of deconstruction as an alternative to mechanical demolition to a, a citywide level. And so there was literally a hearing, um, uh, I guess back in February of 2015, around the, that demolition delay. Um, a lot of the neighborhood folks came out um, and said, we'd really like to see deconstruction um, as an alternative to mechanical demolition. You know, thank you for shoring this, uh, this demolition delay, but uh, we really want to see deconstruction and, and city staff that were spearheading um, the effort on the demolition delay said during that hearing, yes, we recognize deconstruction is an important alternative. We, we don't have the expertise in our uh, our committee 
um, we would recommend that someone else pick that up. So, so during that hearing, our, our mayor directed my bureau, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, to um, convene an advisory group and, and come back within, I don't know, three to four months with recommendations on how to advance deconstruction. So that was really a pivotal moment. We had a green light from you know, the top of city government um, to, to move forward and start crafting something. And by April of 2015, we had convened, oh, I'd say probably around 20, 20 folks um, uh, in our deconstruction advisory group or DAG. And that consisted of a, a pretty diverse group of stakeholders, including builders, home builders, demolition contractors. Uh, we had neighborhood representation from one of the neighborhood groups that had formed around uh, the issue of demolition. Uh, folks from an internal uh, development committee that uh, um, kind of monitors permitting issues. We had folks from the historic preservation community, obviously folks from the salvage and deconstruction industry, both for-profit and non-profit, uh, the construction, demolition, debris, recycling industry, our internal uh, building permitting staff, and then also staff from our regional government and, and even folks from kind of Seattle, King County, Vancouver, BC, and some of the surrounding counties uh, here in Portland uh, would often listen, listen in on these meetings. So as a group, we determined the, the best way to move forward was with a phased approach. So that's what we ended up kind of taking the city council as a first, first step. And so start off with, with incentives as we move towards uh, requirements. So a, a voluntary based deconstruction grant program is what we what we put forward and we had some some funding kind of some seed funding to get that going. Um, and the the grant program had merits in and of itself with goals for learning from the projects, data collection, promotion of deconstruction and the folks that are, are doing that work. Um, I mean, and then also spurring innovation, but I, I think its greatest merit was that it, it served as a first step towards getting folks used to the idea of deconstruction instead of just going straight to requirements. So it's kind of a, a soft launch, a kind of a warm up. And, uh, you know, after about six months of having the grant program, we were ready to take the next step. And in February of 2016, we took a resolution to city council that directed our bureau to develop code language that required full deconstruction for a house or a duplex if that structure was built in 1916 or earlier um, or the st structure was designated as a historic resource regardless of age um, and then we would provide some exemptions since not all houses um, should probably be deconstructed and then uh, we'd ensure training opportunities and prioritizing participation of uh, people of color, women, and other historically underrepresented or disadvantaged groups in the field of construction. And the, the threshold of 1916 or earlier was chosen because it, it represented one third of our house demolitions in Portland in the years leading up to the ordinance. At the time it was also 100 years old, so houses that were 100 years old, there was a certain kind of ring to that, but, but really more importantly it represented a third. And when we were working with our advisory group and, and discussing, you know, where we should set the, the line, um, our, you know, the the kind of the biggest stakeholders in this were the uh, the salvage folks, the ones that were going to be actually doing this work and selling the materials. So we worked with them um, to, you know, what would this look like? If we were to triple the number of uh, houses you take down in a year, and triple the amount of material you need to sell in your uh, retail facility, um, you know, what would that, what would that look like? Um, and so everybody felt that uh, that 1916 was right about the right right spot. Um, and so in, in uh, July 2016, we had an ordinance um, that went into a, uh, that that was passed by city council unanimously again, 1916 or earlier, or uh, if the structure was designated as historic. And we would rely on certified deconstruction contractors to do that work. Um, 
and just briefly a Venn diagram uh, showing, you know, this is tied to demolition permit, so it's not a separate uh, demo per permit. Um, it's uh, it's part of the demolition permit. So if it's you know 1916 or earlier or historic, and it's a house or a duplex, it has to be deconstructed using a certified deconstruction contractor. And you know these are some of the concerns that we had leading up to passing the ordinance. And I just want to hit on these briefly. Uh, we really had three primary stakeholders, developers, deconstructionists, um, and then the neighborhoods. And, and they all had their own concerns, but um, I don't think we could leave any of those on the table. So you know, developers had uh, uh, concerns about cost. And so we pointed to uh, increased competition would bring down prices. And we also had grants available as we launched to help uh, soften any kind of increase in, in costs. Uh, developers also had uh, concern about time that it takes to deconstruct. Um, we pointed to competition again as a way to um, decrease that time and there'd be innovations in the marketplace. Um, availability of contractors um, was a concern. We uh, had both a contractor training and a workforce training. Um, uh, we provided exemptions for houses that probably aren't worthy of deconstructing um, and then used certified deconstruction contractors to address concerns about maximizing salvage and avoiding greenwashing. Um, developers and deconstructions both had concerns about flooding the material market. Um, and so the year built threshold was a way to uh, address that. And then uh, workforce and hiring concerns, um, providing workforce training. Sean, and now I'll move on to implementation. Can you hear me, Sean? Yes, I can. Okay, just a quick note that we're uh, just a little past the halfway point. Great, thank you. I think we're right on track. Um, so implementation, I'll, I'll kind of switching gears here a little bit. I'll, I'll go over um, kind of how we supported the industry. I'm, I'm not going to get so much into the programmatic side of it there, um, but happy to entertain any questions afterwards if you have um, specific questions about kind of the programmatic components of it. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we use certified deconstruction contractors the we use the building materials reuse association as kind of a, a third party to um, certify our contractors and they're they're a national uh, membership organization nonprofit that focuses on deconstruction salvage and, and reuse so I think kind of similar um, to this organization CRRA um, and our initial certification requirements included a written exam, a skills assessment out in the field, and then documenting 500 hours of experience. And then the city maintains that list of certified, currently certified contractors. After about a year into the ordinance, we were seeing some contractors getting certified for just one project. Um, this, this started to dilute the, the pool of contractors and, and we were also having some compliance issues with a couple of them. So we ended up setting the bar a little bit higher after the first year, um, increasing the number of hours of experience, um, requiring some actual training um, so that couldn't just be voluntary, uh, and then um, also including some lead-based paint and asbestos inspector certification requirements. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that right after the ordinance um, was approved by council, we held a contractor training in July of 2016. And this was also, also done through the BMRA, or Building Materials Reuse Association. It was a, a three-day training. We had uh, 16 participants from 12 different companies. Ten of those companies were uh, minority or women owned or emerging small business certified firms. And we also held a skills assessment at the end of that three day training for anybody that wanted to go on to um, at least check that, that box off their certification requirements. Um, so that was in July of 2016. Um, so we had enough contractors and, and they had enough existing employees for us to launch in October of 2016, but we knew there'd probably be an increased need for hiring as we move towards summer of 2017 um, and busier construction season. So we held a workforce training um, and prioritized participation of women, people of color, and other disadvantaged 
groups and, and worked with local pre-apprenticeship programs and nonprofits to identify candidates that were interested in that workforce training. And the, the result was we had a really diverse crew of 15 students, half of whom were women. Um, and the training took place at four different active deconstruction sites around town. Um, and then wrapped up with a meet and greet um, between the students and the contractors. And so just uh, kind of getting into the kind of the programmatic part just on this one slide. Um, again, uh, it's part, the deconstruction requirement falls under the demolition permit process. Um, if someone comes in uh, to take down a house or duplex and it was built in 1916 or earlier or historic resource, and it's not exempt, so we do have exemptions for like fire damage or extensive rot or mold or a dangerous building. Um, the certified deconstruction contractor has to submit a pre-deconstruction form, and that's a kind of password protected form, so only the contractors can submit that. Once I know who the contractor is, I sign off on my portion of the demolition permit. And then once deconstruction gets started, uh, they put up some site signage on site, letting everybody know it's being deconstructed. And then uh, I perform random inspections out in the field. And after the building's down, the, the same contractor submits a post deconstruction form and uh, receipts for the materials that were salvaged, receipts for material that uh, went into the Dropbox. And then once I receive that, that allows them to call in for their final inspections and close out the permit. Okay, so outcomes, first two years. So again, started in October 31st, 2016, so we're a little over two years, but um, to, you know, at the Two year mark, so back in October 2018, um, we've had 168 houses subject to the ordinance, and um, that has remained at one third of uh, all demolitions fall into that kind of 1916 or older or historic. Um, so it didn't didn't end up changing the the landscape of demolition permits. It, it's remained uh, remained the same, and then uh, that translates to about a little less than two million pounds of material that was salvaged for reuse and I want to emphasize that word reuse so we're not talking about recycling so the, the remainder of that material went to a recovery facility they sort through it and pull out what can be recycled um, but but we're focused on the salvage part and so just under two million pounds for reuse or salvage um, we currently have 12 certified contractors that number is uh, um, used to be as high as 17, but it slowly dropped off primarily um, due to the loss of certification associated with the, the new requirements around lead and asbestos certification. Um, and then two new deconstruction only companies, two that, that started as a result of this ordinance, um, uh, quickly moved on to open their own retail uh, facilities to sell materials. Uh, one of those was Northwest Deconstruction Specialists. They uh, opened up a retail store called Reclaim Northwest, and um, this is always kind of a fun picture. This is a table they constructed, and each one of those panels represents a different house, um, the first seven houses that they uh, took down under the ordinance. And then this is uh, Goodwood Deconstruction and Salvage. This is a shot from their uh, retail facility and 100% and of the lumber you see here uh, came from uh, houses that were taken down under the ordinance. And then more recently uh, the Japanese retailer Muji which has I think over 400 uh, retail stores around the world uh, located their their Northwest store here in Portland um, a couple months ago and uh, um, they, they always want to uh, make sure that the store reflects the, the kind of the local flavor of where it's located. And uh, they chose Portland over Seattle because of our commitment to recycling and sustainability was more in tune in the retailer's way of doing business. So their, their showroom features over 204 reclaimed old growth timbers um, that are uh, in their display, as you can see there in the photograph. 
And uh, Oregon State University uh, down in Corvallis is currently doing some research around using salvage lumber in cross laminated uh, timber panels. So if you're familiar with CLTs, it's kind of alternating uh, direction of two by sixes or two by fours kind of glued and pressed together under immense pressure to uh, develop these structural um, panels for building. And uh, they collected a bunch of two by fours from three different Portland companies, so houses that were deconstructed. They took that lumber down to Corvallis. They've been cleaning it up and processing it, and they're literally waiting to um, stick it in some, some presses, waiting for some press time, um, and they'll see how it stacks up against um, conventional virgin, virgin lumber. And then our Oregon Department of Environmental Quality um, has done a lot of work around um, uh, researching the carbon and energy impacts associated with deconstructed houses versus mechanical demolition. Um, they've, uh, we've got a draft report from them, hoping that'll be out here in the next month. Um, and some of the, the major findings is that the, the carbon benefit for deconstruction is about double um, that of mechanical demolition. Um, on an energy, from an energy standpoint, uh, deconstruction is, is actually 20% lower than demolition um, in terms of the benefit. So, so demolition is 20% better um, in terms of energy, and that's because the, of the wood to energy, so burning wood uh, offsets natural gas use. Um, and then another major finding was that the, the transport of materials and workers and, and equipment use, you know, the fuel that's associated with that has little effect on the total results, uh, which suggests that, that further transport of materials could be justified. So uh, a lot of times if we, we take materials and send it too far, uh, there might be concerns about the carbon uh, impact of that. But um, I'll show you in a slide here in a minute how, how small that is compared to uh, salvaging material. Um, they also found that the, the quantities of salvage material is tied more closely to actual contractors that do the work as opposed to house size. So some contractors um, appear to be doing a better job than others. And then kind of final big takeaway is that, that wood is, is king. Wood is really where um, we see the biggest impact and that's what the majority of the material that's salvaged. So on, on this slide, um, this is basically a, a graph of the, the salvage, the weight of salvage materials and that, that first bar there, the one that's ginormous, um, is softwood lumber. And so when we're really, when we're talking about the impact of um, deconstruction, it's, it's really softwood lumber and to a lesser degree plywood and then everything else is um, pales in comparison. And this is uh, kind of highlighting the, the net benefit from a carbon standpoint per house of, of uh, um, deconstruction versus mechanical demolition. And it's equivalent of 1.6 cars off the road um, for a year for each house that's deconstructed. So, if, you know, multiply that times the number of houses that are coming down every year. And uh, this is the kind of material worker transport, um, material transport and equipment use, um, the relative uh, benefits of those compared to materials. So you can, you can see um, the, the last three columns are really small compared to the benefits and impacts of the materials. And then, uh, uh, I call this side growth ring. So um, we are, uh, we were the first ones to um, to require deconstruction. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, last year uh, passed an ordinance that requires deconstruction for for houses. Uh, I believe 1929 um, or older. Vancouver, BC, January 1st of this year. Um, has a, a deconstruction ordinance went into effect that applies to 1910 or older houses, and that was right sized um, for them. Uh, San Francisco Bay Area um, and Seattle King County and San Antonio have all uh, convened at advisory groups of uh, one sort or another and are pursuing um, potentially something to advance deconstruction in their uh, their areas. Um, also, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has been really instrumental in, in helping 
advance the conversation in the Bay Area and then up in King County in Seattle. Um, the Building Materials Reuse Association that I mentioned, we use their curriculum and, and trainers for our our work um, is is a, a kind of a great way to tap into kind of the national conversation. Um, Oregon DEQ mentioned that them a couple of minutes ago, their, their research um, and also funding has really helped with our, uh, our trainings and our grant program. Um, and then finally, there's been a, I would say in the past two years, a real uptick in the number of um, kind of university students researching deconstruction from, from all angles, historic preservation, um, the CLT efforts I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so that's really exciting to see. And then couple more slides before I finish up and we go to, to questions. Um, these are kind of key ingredients or advice that I have for any jurisdiction that's looking at doing something similar. And um, I used to have this on one slide and it got really cramped. So I've, I've broken it up into to two slides because there's just, there's so many, <laughs> so many bits of advice and, and key ingredients, but these are some, some highlights. Um, you know, I, having some sort of sponsorship from the top of your, your local government, so whether that's someone in city council or a mayor, um, that, that goes a long ways to, to really get in some traction. Um, our deconstruction advisory group had every possible stakeholder I could think of at the table, and you know that, that makes for hard conversations during your advisory group meetings. Um, but it's easier to have those conversations in those meetings instead of uh, at an audience at, at city council. So um, the hard questions get asked there and then you need to figure out ways to answer them. Um, and, and understanding all those concerns. Uh, community support, having the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood support this I think was really critical. Um, we had deconstruction, salvage slash reuse in our, our guiding kind of plan documents like our climate action plan, our comprehensive plan. Um, and, uh, and that was really helpful when we were crafting resolutions and ordinances, we could point back to those and say, you know, are these guiding documents, um, uh, you know, talk about this and this is one of the ways we can realize um, those goals that are found in those plans. And then also knowing why you're behind promoting deconstruction, why you're trying to advance it. Um, you know, ours was more about diversion and, and carbon benefits less so about hazmat, even though we recognize there are a lot of benefits there. Um, but had we uh, uh, wanted to focus solely on hazmat, um, the, the outcome probably would have looked different. Um, second page of key ingredients and advice would be uh, ease into regulations. So, um, you know, for us, that was in the form of grants. So it was kind of voluntary based, a way to uh, get folks used to the I idea and then went into regulations. Um, I think right-sizing the regulations for your local industry or your local market is really important. So again, for us, 1916, that represented around a third. Um, that's been, uh, you know, aggressive enough to uh, spawn an industry and, and advancement in that industry, but not, not so much that it uh, kind of overwhelms that we had uh, plenty of folks in the neighborhoods that wanted to see it beyond 1916 because um, they wanted, uh, you know, to salvage more materials. But if the market's not there, um, it's going to be challenging. Uh, and then uh, even, even the builders wanted to require it for everything um, in hopes that it would fail. So they knew if we uh, required it for everything, um, it would overwhelm the market and it would fail. Um, so we, we practiced restraint and set it at 1916. Vancouver, BC, 1910 is what works for, for them. Um, uh, certifying contractors, I think, is really important. Um, that helps with quality control. You don't just have people kind of greenwashing and, and saying they're going to deconstruct it and then ultimately knock it down. Um, we put some of our requirements in admin rules instead of uh, the actual code language. So that gives us a little bit more flexibility in updating those quickly if we need to. Um, market demand for materials uh, has got to be there, otherwise your deconstruction is going to cost a lot. Um, the, you know, one of the ways to offset labor costs is through the sale of materials, so uh, I think that's really key. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, I don't think has 
has as uh, robust a demand for their materials, so their their deconstruction bids are really high. Ours have, have come down over the past couple of years and are increasingly becoming competitive with mechanical demolition. Um, and then finally, outlets for materials. I think both nonprofit and for-profit are uh, important. Nonprofits are going to sell stuff that maybe doesn't have as much value um, as other things. So, you know, toilet sinks, fixtures um, uh, are great places uh, that uh, the, to go for for nonprofits. And then finally, supporting contractors and the workforce. All right, that's it for me. One minute and a half over. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Pretty good. And happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, that was great. Um, there's so much there that will help people, you know, not have to reinvent the wheel. So, um, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Detail. Um, we've got one question so far. Actually, two. Um, first one is, and by the way, um, folks on the line. Um, if you missed the beginning, where you will enter your questions is in the chat box, which you may have to expand in your control panel, uh, which on my screen is in the upper right, and, and then the chat is at the bottom. Um, so you just have to click on that arrow and then enter whatever question you may have there, and I'll go through them and pass them on to Sean. So first question, Sean, is from Joe McCluskey who asks, what is the most common destination for salvaged materials? Are they sold or are they donated to a nonprofit for the tax write-off? I, I would say uh, that it's more common that they're, they're sold. So the, we do have a, a, you know, non, two nonprofits here in town. So the Rebuilding Center and then Habitat for Humanities Restore. I think in the you know, 150 plus projects that have come across my desk, only one uh, donated material to Habitat's Restore. Um, uh, the Rebuilding Center gets a fair amount of material, um, and I think they got more material earlier on in the ordinance. Um, they're, they're one of our top deconstruction companies, so they, they both deconstruct and sell their own material. But with the, the evolution of uh, these for-profit contractors that have since opened up their own retail facilities, you know, if I if I had to guess, I'd say, uh, you know, three quarters of the materials being sold um, from nonprofit uh, standpoint, and then the remainder goes to uh, our nonprofits, where you could potentially get a tax um, benefit. the The trick is um, he, here locally, most of our demolitions are coming down. Uh, to pave way for new developments. So, so that means a, a builder, you know, a development company owns the property and when they demolish a house, and I don't quite understand all the, the tax stuff here, but my understanding is when they demolish the house, they uh, kind of write off the, the loss of the house um, and they are not allowed through tax law to simultaneously take a uh, a deduction based on their the salvage value, even if they donated, it'd be kind of like double dipping. Um, and so, the the tax benefit would really only work if it was, let's say, a, a homeowner who's taking down their own house and they're going to build build a new house for their retirement or something like that. So um, even though material gets donated, I don't think a lot of builders um, or even homeowners for that matter um, try to take advantage of the, the tax benefits. All right. Thank you, Sean. A um, couple more questions here. So uh, one from Bart Carr asking, what is the average cost of a deconstruction for a single home, I guess? Uh, uh, so I'm gonna I'll give you kind of some numbers that um, you know are kind of soft um, just because I don't I'm not privy to this information a lot of times we you know we we did have access to that during the grant program um, so we would ask the contractors to let us know what the cost was so we had a pretty decent decent idea during the grant process but um, excluding so this is the the footnote excluding concrete removal so the foundation so these deconstruction contractors they take down the house and when they get down to the you know concrete foundation and the basement walls that's where they walk away and then a, a 
uh, excavator comes in, removes that, backfills the basement, and grades it, and gets it ready for for new development. Um, I would say for average sized house around fourteen hundred square feet, uh, the cost to deconstruct um, would range from um, let's say nine thousand to uh, fifteen thousand. So number of different things are going to factor into that, you know, the value of the materials, the condition of the house, um, are there lots of layers of drywall and plaster and heavy roofing, multiple layers of roofing that'll um, raise your tip costs uh, to dump that material. Um, so it's always going to be a range. It's like asking people, what's it going to cost to remodel my kitchen? Um, you know, you're going to get a range of, range of numbers. Um, but, you know, over the past two years, uh, I would say that, that the deconstruction bids have come down, whereas mechanical demolition bids have gone up. Um, and so part of that is disposal costs. Um, so that Senate Bill 871 requirements that went into effect in July uh, now require for mechanical demolition that you have to hand remove all the exterior siding that's painted. So that's assuming it uh, contains lead. Um, so their cost, demolition costs since July have gone up probably probably 17 percent. Um, so from from the little bit of information that that I see, um, I would, and, I, and I've heard this from from some contractors, uh, from some builders, that uh, it's essentially a wash for them cost-wise, um, deconstruction versus mechanical demolition. Um, deconstruction is still going to take longer. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to get around that. You're, you're taking it apart by hand versus, you know, a day and a half of smashing it. Um, but but cost-wise, uh, it's it's pretty darn competitive. Thank you, Sean. Um, another question. What is the consequence? This is from Andrew Becerra. What is the consequence for not following the ordinance requirements? Um, That's a great, yeah. great question. Um, so we've got a couple of things. Uh, we can, you know, the, the biggest thing we were concerned about was someone saying, yeah, whatever, I'm not going to deconstruct it. I'm not going to use a certified deconstructor. I'm just going to knock it down. That's the cost. You know, that's the, whatever fine you charge me is the cost of doing business. Um, so we have up to a $10,000 uh, fine that, that uh, if someone you know blatantly disregards the regulations and knocks it down, we've got a $10,000 fine. Um, we've had one case where I think some, some, something got lost in translation and a house uh, came down at least partially uh, with a uh, uh, mechanical piece of equipment and so we, we find them pretty heavily. Uh, we are and, but I think probably the, the thing that keeps um, the deconstruction contractors in check the most is, is not only can we uh, assess a, a fine if, if they're found in uh, noncompliance, we can also suspend their certification. Um, so that's, that's one of the beauties of having a certification and having a list of folks that are certified. Um, if, if they don't play by the rules, um, you know, what we've done for a couple is we find them and then we suspend their certification. And it, it's that certification suspension that I think is the biggest hit. So um, you don't, you don't want to suddenly kind of close your doors um, because of uh, some sort of penalty. So that, I think that's probably the, probably the more important of our uh, enforcement mechanisms. Great, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so more questions are rolling in than we probably have time for, but I'm going to pick a few more here. A uh, question from Alice Zanmiller. Do the um, deconstruction and mechanical demo permits cost the same? I guess the, the permit fees. Um, yes, okay. they do. <laughs> they do. Um, we had talked early on about, you know, maybe we have a little lower cost for deconstruction, higher cost for demolition, but long story short, uh, state law says that permit fees can only cover um, staff time for the actual review. So you can't artificially inflate one to try and incentivize another. Um, and, and if anything, deconstruction would cost more because um, I'm part of any permit that uh, requires deconstruction, and so we don't we don't capture that. That just comes out of our our bureau's budget. But from a, a pure accounting standpoint, deconstruction would cost more from a permit review standpoint. But we we think that's um, would be kind of bad optics to to have deconstruction costs more from a permit standpoint than uh, mechanical demolition. 
Okay. Um, so let's see, we've got a question about your methodology for calculating the CO2 savings. I think that's going to be uh, too involved to share here, but if, is there anything about that you could say briefly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so our, our uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality um, will uh, release their report um, that, that I cited those kind of preliminary findings from hopefully in the next month and and that'll be shared uh, broadly it's it's a really hefty report you know I want to say 60 some some pages so it's chock full of good information and then uh, they are sharing the kind of the data that's involved in that on something that's called R value or R something it, it's uh, out of my kind of technical expertise but um, people that really want to geek out on that can uh, the, the all the data is going to be publicly available and if people want to use it for their own benefits to kind of crunch crunch numbers in their jurisdiction they're more than welcome to use it the the caveat is that um, the research that DEQ did is uh, heavily calibrated to to our conditions here so you know the, the model they use takes into account how far uh, the the um, landfill is from Portland and average trips and whether we flare methane or don't flare methane and how much is burned versus landfilled and um, so it's it's pretty robust but um, it, it wouldn't necessarily be a plug and play for another jurisdiction you'd have to fine-tune some of those variables um, and Sean will that report be available on the city's website did you say yeah, I think I think that would be a great play. I'm sure it'll be on. It, it would either be on DEQs and we'd reference it, um, or uh, or on ours. And we're going to do a pretty uh, um, broad kind of outreach. Um, so I know that folks in the BMRA will be interested. Um, you know, folks in, in this organization. So when when that's available, I have no problem um, just kind of sending links out to to your membership. And then I know folks at EPA are really interested. So um, we'll share that pretty broadly when it's available. Okay, that will be great. Um, all right. So looking at a few more questions here. Um, this is from Manuel Medrano. Uh, oh, huh. Uh, well, anyway, can you further explain the process that helped you determine your local deconstruction material market? Uh, can you say that one again? Um, yeah, or let's see, and Manuel, if you want to clarify in the chat, um, go ahead. It has to do with uh, determining the deconstruction, the, the market for the materials that are coming out of the deconstruction projects. Um, I know you talked about a couple of companies that evolved because of the ordinance and then mm. the retail stores. Um, is, did that just sort of happen organically? Did the city uh, facilitate that and, you know, make sure that there was enough kind of demand? Yeah, yeah. So I guess on the on the front end of it, so when we chose 1916, um, we knew that that would translate to about 100 houses a year um, based on our, our, our uh, number of demolition permits at that time. So that, that was the original question we posed to our advisory group. Um, we knew that maybe 20 to 30 houses came down a year pre-ordinance. So the, the question was, all right, if we, if we triple that, if we're looking at 100 houses coming down, a year. Um, what does that look like to you folks that take houses down and sell materials? And, and so the consensus was, yeah, that's aggressive, but it's something that we can uh, work towards. And, and so that, you know, we launched it in October, which is a little bit slower time of the year. Um, and uh, um, that would allow them to, to ramp up. So, so we knew that we had a, a fairly robust market for this material from the get go. Um, we've had a pretty hands-off approach for two years in terms of, you know, just watching the market evolve and, and some of these new companies and new retail outlets opening up. Um, and our, I guess, kind of official position is um, let's let the market do what it wants to do. Um, and it's kind of survival of the fittest. So whoever can, you know, do these projects for the least amount of money and maximize the value of the salvage materials, um, that's that's what we're most concerned about. And, and one of the things we've seen 
um, and this is based a little bit on that, that research that DEQ did, um, is that the contractors that are salvaging the most material are also the contractors that um, are winning the most jobs. And, and so that suggests that, that these contractors are, are maximizing the value of the material they're getting out of the buildings to offset their labor costs. Um, and so it's, you know, we don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, nosing around and you know, looking in Dropbox and saying, oh, that could be salvaged or that could be salvaged. There's a built-in market incentive for them to salvage more material because that's, that's where the value is and, and um, it offsets their, their labor costs. Um, you know, we're, I think, at a junction now, now where we'd like to um, advance that year built and maybe take it to 1940. That would double what we're doing now. Um, but at, at, the, at the same time, at this moment in time, our, the number of demolition permits in Portland have, have dropped off pretty significantly um, here over the past year. Um, so even uh, raising that, that year built threshold um, might just keep things the way they are or have been for the past couple of years in terms of the amount of material coming out. So the, the demand is still strong, um, but the, the number of demolition permits is currently down. So. Um, it might be a good opportunity to to raise that that year built. So hopefully that answers your question. But um, I, I I am starting to work with uh, kind of um, some local uh, um, economic development and and even um, uh, international uh, shipping of lumber uh, type organizations to to see what we can do to kind of further elevate the the retail side of things here um, in preparation for advancing that year built threshold. Okay, great. So uh, with that, we're getting close to uh, 1130. So I think I'm going to stop taking questions. Um, did you have any final thoughts, Sean, before we close? Um, I don't other than, you know, hopefully my contact information is still up on the screen. If you've got, yeah. uh, uh, specific questions, um, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. I'm, you know, it's it's probably my favorite part of my job is is sharing this information with folks and in hopes of uh, other jurisdictions adopting something similar. Um, I I deliberately wrote our code to try to be as universal as possible. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, if you were to read their ordinance, it's um, very similar to ours. Uh, so, so hopefully, um, you know, this conversation today inspires some folks and um, you can do something similar. I wouldn't say it's a one size fits all, but um, there's things that we learned along the way that, that I'm happy to um, you know, discuss with you if, if you've got a specific question. Um, City of San Antonio has reached out to me a fair amount um, just to, with our experience with our advisory group and, and what were the best ways to craft that and who was at the table. Um, you know, the, the outcome may be different in San Antonio than it is here, but um, I, can, I can almost in, uh, assure you that the questions that you'll get are, are going to be similar to ones we had here. Well, I think the information you shared is going to be useful to um, a lot of people who are starting to think about this or have begun the process and will save us all a lot of time. And Lord knows we don't have that much time when we're <laughs> talking about climate change and things like that. So, um, so that's actually, I think, really important for this information to be shared. Um, thank you, Sean, and thank you to everyone in attendance. Thanks for joining the webinar. This is uh, the ninth webinar in our series, and we're going to continue to have them uh, roughly every other month. So please do stay in touch. Um, if you are not a member of CRRA or of the Prevention, Reuse, and Repair Council, Technical Council, and you're interested in being a member of either one, um, go to CRRA.com, and you'll find information there. So thank you again to Sean. Thanks all of you and have a wonderful day. All right. Thanks, Shauna. Great. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.